to the 52nd annual Brad and Jeff Halloween program, or is it the 53rd? I what I can't remember. 53rd. 53rd. The 53rd annual Brad and Jeff Halloween Classic, and we're glad you're along tonight. Sit back. We're going to have a lot of fun. There's some amazing art to look at, and if you haven't seen it, uh, prepare to take a look at it if you're on the Internet at all. We have some wonderful ghost stories, perhaps the best contingent of entries ever, and it, it, it becomes almost impossible to select winners in, in a case like we are, are blessed with here. There are so many talented people out there. It just, it's amazing what they send in. It's fun for you. Now, you've been a professional writer for all these 53 years. And, 55. Uh, 55? Yeah. And, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, but before we it get, is true. Yeah. Before we get started, <laughs> I want to just give my annual pitch to all of you parents who are going out with your, your children to have fun. Have fun. But for goodness sakes, understand that the... The manufactured, mass-produced candy is not good for you, your family, so find something to do with it. The idea of going out and knocking door to door and showing off your costume uh, maybe help the little ones understand that it's as much fun for the people opening the door as it is for the the youngsters to dress up and go out and and just interact and have fun. So, but the... (laughs) Don't let them eat that junk. It's a lot of junk, and worse than that in some cases. So for those of you who are having uh, block parties or otherwise school parties and church functions and things, uh, we wish you the very best on the special weekend, which comes around so very fast, faster each and every year. It is truly amazing. Now, And neither should you accept from a sweet, smiling grandmother, (laughs) the muffins that she's cooked to give out. You might be a little hesitant in that, too. Any baked goods that are handed out. Unless she's a direct blood relative or a family member. Yes. I wouldn't do it. (laughs) It Even even then, these days, you can't be certain. Well, see, the problem is the processed foods that, that are used to even scratch, prepare muffins and cookies are often full of, well, Tell it like it is. Toxic materials, aspartame, MSG, all kinds of junk. Plastic. Uh, plastic, FD and C, the dyes, uh, yellow, yellow lake, uh, blue, green, red, FD and C, 40, red. These are, these are really things you do not want in your children's bodies. And you'll notice that all the snack size candy bars that are given out. Mars, I uh, had Betty Martini on Wednesday, who has been battling the aspartame wars for 19 years, and she called Mars, and, and she said, I want a straight answer. Do you or do you not put aspartame in your in your candy? And they said, yes, Miss Martini, we do use aspartame in our Mars bars. So it's there, and it's a shame, because when Brad uh, was young, uh, that was before candy bars, but when I was young, <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> they had... They had we we uh, didn't have... Uh, <laughs> I never went trick-or-treating. No, we, we would have... Uh, a party at at uh, one of the friends' right. home, and I guess it was dunking for apples, caramel apples. Sometimes but that's hard to dunk for, isn't it? Yeah, I I, I meant you break I a few put teeth a on that. There, dunking for apples that float, and then maybe a treat might be a caramel apple and mm-hmm. popcorn, mm-hmm. which of course was popped right there by mm-hmm. by the mothers. Well, those were the days, and then the candy bars came out. And when candy bars first came out for you younger people, and that's people in their 30s and, and on down, there were, like, let's just say, a Milky Way, I, I, whatever, Baby Ruth. There were six mm-hmm. or seven ingredients. That's it. Mm-hmm. And, and now if you look at the label, you need a magnifying glass first. I don't know how they make font that small still recognizable. It's almost as if you need a microscope. But there are 40 and 50 ingredients sometimes in these things. I looked at a box of powdered donuts. I told this story years ago. I just, for fun, when I was a kid, powdered donuts were fun. And there were over 50 5 ingredients 
in these little white simple powdered donuts, powdered sugar. You mean those donuts. little tiny ones that come in a box. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Doesn't matter what size; it's the same process. But mm. ungodly amounts of of uh, things that you couldn't pronounce, and if you can't pronounce it, you know you don't want it in you. And now they hide MSG behind probably close to a hundred different labels, names. Uh, they can name it anything they want if they just cut it 2% with anything else. Let's say you have a one pound of MSG and you exchange 2% of that volume with, with uh, flour. You can call it anything you want. Anything. Enhanced yeast protein. Sounds pretty good. It's MSG. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Okay. So read labels. We spent a lot of time on this program trying to help. Jeffrey Smith at SeedsOfDeception.com has the most invaluable information, as does Rents.com. Just type in MSG and aspartame and start reading. And they're they're cutting sugar with aspartame now because it's it's uh, oh ten times less expensive to produce and actually to to buy refined sugar. It's it's so cheap, and it turns into. Methyl alcohol, which causes blindness and seizures. It turns into f- formic acid, which further breaks down into formaldehyde. And it turns into DKP, diketopiprazine, which is a known brain tumor agent. It will cause brain tumors. Okay? This is what aspartame is, NutraSweet. That's, that's what it breaks down to every single time in your stomach, goes into your bloodstream, and you, you get to deal with it. So understand, Halloween can be fun, but the collection and eating of candies uh, is not what it used to be. Uh, was it when we were kids used to worry about some deviant somewhere would put a pin in an apple? Remember that they'd put a needle in an yeah, apple. That yeah, was the that real. Really that was a big. That was a fright. Do, but uh, yeah. I'm sure somebody did it. Well, it was uh, a you fright could put thing. it into a caramel apple, I suppose, but otherwise, yeah. just putting a razor blade in an apple. Well, it was just these horror stories would come out. Oh every, yeah. yeah, every year. But okay. now it's it's the food labels that are the horror stories, and unfortunately, on the individually snack sized candy bars, there are no ingredients listed. They just put them on the large package that 50 little bars come in. They don't have to put them on the individual bars. Another concession and favor from the Food and Death Administration. So, all right. There's our little uh, disclaimer and and have fun, but by all means, look at your children and are they carrying any extra body weight? Yes, most of them, so they they don't need the sugar anyhow. All right. Now, Back to the uh, the great contest this year, and it, it has been a grand one. Uh, the art. And what we'll do in just a minute or two after the first break is we'll start to look at the art pieces, which we do. And it's just fun to walk through the gallery and look at them all. They all have their strengths, and they all have their weaknesses. All some, of them. Some have more weaknesses than others, <laughs> but they're, it's the <laughs> well, thought let's that just say it. We'll concentrate on the strengths. Yeah, yeah. And it was tough this year for uh for our panel our August it panel of judges. Was. There were shots <laughs> fired, but uh cooler heads <laughs> eventually prevailed and we we settled on a unique <laughs> resolution. I mean I haven't been threatened this much by friends I can't remember when. Um <laughs> No, I we we didn't argue. No, no, no. No, but but it was difficult, and it uh, required many long hours of uh, reading and rereading and hashing things back and forth. We, I think, we should stress, you know, to our listeners that we don't take this lightly. You know, we don't we don't put them up at a wall and throw darts. You know, we really uh, spend time yeah, analyzing have, them and evaluating. Them. Right, we have pictures of a bomber for that. All right. Uh, be right back in just a couple minutes.
It's the 29th, two days away from Halloween, and I hope the weather is nice wherever you are. Monday will be November 1st. Gee, Tuesday is election day. Good luck. And so forth. It's, it's going to be, I think, a pretty wild November. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of Americans are going to have a rather Spartan Christmas, as they say. A holiday season, no matter what your religion, faith, persuasion, or belief system. It's uh, affecting everyone. We will see. There are some very good uh, deals available already. I'm seeing, a, you know, buy two, get 27 free things. Not quite that bad. Maybe not good. Or quite that good. Uh, I did see a buy buy one and get two free, a shoe thing. Uh, pay less shoes, I think. Uh, don't mean to push brands, but they're starting early. And, I mean, it's not even November. And, you know, it used to be the day after Thanksgiving, I guess, was the big shopping. <laughs> but they're, they're coming at us. That was long ago. Yeah. They don't... Uh, they don't have much hope for a, a big season, and, and everybody's maxed out, as they say. Or holding on to it. The, the uh, what is that? That's a wolf. Sounds like it. The banks are sitting on an awful lot of money. They're not letting it go. What are they trying to prove? They already have fractional reserve, which is a, a gift from the... If ever there was a gift from the gods, the gods of corruption and uh, money lust, it was fractional reserve banking. So they're, they're just... The system is stagnant, and it's not, not good. So keep in mind, one present per family member is fine. You don't have to buy 10, 12. You don't have to get into the competing and, and trying to outdo Uncle Bob and Aunt Jane and, and gee, Mom got me this and Dad only got me that and Santa Santa brought me this. and Don't compare, kids. Uh, just, you know, if you get one present, treasure it, enjoy it. It's the season, it's the idea, and I'm sure your parents will tell you. Thanksgiving is not just one day. Uh, Thanksgiving is every day. It certainly should be. I know p many people are in despair, and we certainly send. Um, we do. Our sympathy and empathy, and all the best for things to improve quickly. I don't uh, know what the answer is, but uh, if we can no, only, if we can just, if we could rise up as a people and flush the toilet of corruption and criminality and gangsterism and fraud, uh, this nation could rise again, as it once did, to a position as the light of the world. And uh, we still have it as a people, but we are under such incredible control. Talk about horrors and ghost stories and monsters and evil. Uh, you have to look no further than Washington, D.C. to find applications of those terms that stick very adequately. Um, what is that? I think it's an owl. A screech owl. Screech owl. They just don't sit and go hoot hoot. You know? No. Start screeching. We have the door. The door open and the the big oak door open. There's all kinds of things going on back there. I know. Must be getting a little get a little worried about you. No, it, my door is closed. I have a gun on the desk here and no problems. I'm not worried. Uh, all right. Explosives Strange buried around the property. Noises in the background. Mm -hmm. Okay, but well. You, hmm? you know, okay. you're, uh, we're out in Steiger Castle and you're out in Rents Castle, way out in the wilderness. So I guess we have to expect to hear wolves and screech owls and so forth. Yeah, but when you're in the produce section of the market, you don't expect <laughs> yeah. that. 
That's where we're doing the broadcast from tonight? Now, never mind. That would be interesting. That'd be interesting. But the technology they have now, the blue box. Ah, oh, we got to get you a blue box. I keep forgetting. You can plug it into any phone jack anywhere in the world and achieve l literally digital quality studio audio. We talked about this. We got to mm -hmm. talk. We got to talk some mm -hmm. more. Because uh, anytime you do a radio program, you just. Dial your blue box up, and they all have them on the other end now, and they they connect, and that's it. Well, it's hard for me to keep up with all the new technology. Uh, even with the books, I see all of our books are Kindle now. As Kindleized. Well, Congratulations. Well, I call them, you know, you can, they're in the same slot, but you just move down. You can get the real book. And you can get the Kindle book. Well, and I guess the Kindle is real too, except you just push a button and get it in mm -hmm. ten minutes or something. Yep, it's amazing. All right, hold on, gang. We'll be right back and begin our stroll down the Great Steiger Art Gallery as we continue. there too. I, you had that big storm the other day, didn't you? Oh, we were very, very fortunate. Uh, certainly it was a powerful, powerful wind, but not nearly. I mean, the night before we switched to one channel and they said this is going to be the worst in 70 years. Then we went to another channel, weather channel I'm talking about, and they said this is going to be the worst storm in the history for the Midwest, the worst storm in history, worst storm ever. <laughs> We're thinking, you know, do we dare go to bed? Well, we uh, we did have gusts up to sixty miles an hour, but you uh -huh. know, contrary to popular belief, we get those quite often. Right. Uh, so it was just kind of a, a regular little rainstorm. We were very blessed because in other places, you know, that was not so. They really did get a huge storm, but. Uh, we um, thank the Lord we dodged the bullet again. You know, it, it went around us. We've had enough storms this winter. We've had enough wind. We've had enough tiles off uh, the roof and patio being destroyed and, and so forth. It's been quite a summer. But uh, thanks for asking. But we did. We managed uh, that. What that went around us. We well, it was we a, had class... a strong one, but yeah. not uh, yeah. nearly the way they were talking. Worst the, in 70 years, worst in history. Well, the barometric pressure, pressure, or as they say in in old England, pressure, uh, the barometric pressure made it a class three hurricane. Mm -hmm. It was the same. Yeah. That's that's amazing. That was on, I guess, now, Tuesday. I should clarify something. Uh, <laughs> we did have candy bars when I was a child. I made it I know, I know. We just, but remember, I grew up in WW2 time, so rarely did we get candy because that was diverted to the military, to the armed forces, which was very, I mean, we were all happy about that. That was the sacrifice that we were willing to make. And the candy we did get seemed to always be mixed with wax. It all had a waxy taste. Like and, like uh, those uh, vampire teeth would be made of wax, you mean? Yeah, yeah. It, and it they, were, they had sugar in the wax. It kind of spread through all the, all the candy and so forth that we'd get. And, uh, of course, chocolate, all we got, which was probably to our benefit, you know, was that very strong uh, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate, which very healthy. Better for you anyway. Yep. yep. And uh, chewing gum was just almost impossible now neither of my parents smoked neither of them drank but my mom loved to have her chewing gum and i mean it was just uh, a rarity when she'd get one you know she would 
guard it and miser it away, you know, making it last as long as possible. So it wasn't that they didn't have those things. It's just, you know, during the war, and that was the war that, in a sense, every family participated in, uh, that was one of the things we gladly uh, gave up for for our uncles and fathers and sons and brothers overseas. The waxy taste. I remember they had wax teeth, and they still do, and they right. put sugar in there, and you were supposed to chew them up, and it. I don't and then care there was how a much fluid. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They had little like pop bottles mm-hmm. with sugar water in them and right. fl- flavors. Right. Probably real flavors back then. Um, yeah, probably. But the wax always tasted. Like wax. I don't know. I don't care how much sugar you put. It still tastes like wax. But people would chew it up and spit it out. Mm-hmm. And like, they no, still have them. it out. <laughs> you ate the wax? You yeah, waxed it. I mean, it was, Do you remember that it was, line? It was mm-hmm. thoroughly uh, uh, throughout the, uh, the, the treat. You remember the Laurel and Hardy movie where Stan is in... In Ollie's living room, and his wife and here having their perennial troubles. Ollie and mm-hmm. his wife, who was played by Mae Bush, and right. Stan is sitting there <laughs> pretending to read a newspaper. And there's a bowl of, of wax fruit, mm-hmm. grapes, and a banana, and an apple. And he, you know, he'd look left, and he'd listen, and and when he'd think that they weren't watching him, he he reached over and grabbed a, a wax apple. Um, of course, Stan thought it was a real apple. Right. And he took a bite, and you're waiting for him to start gagging. And ch- and he kept right on eating, like it was a real apple. That's Stan. Yeah. And uh, that was the gag. <laughs> he well, ate, there, there he were ate more it. than one of us kids who, after seeing that, <laughs> thought... Well, you really can eat those. But and she, found to yeah, our, our immediate uh, distaste that one really cannot. But well, uh, she, May Bush came in the living room and, and uh, noticed that there was the apple missing from the bowl. And, and Stan had a newspaper, I guess, and, and uh, she grabbed it away and he had the apple. And it was just the core. And she said, you, you wax eater. <laughs> and it was, it was, you had to be there. It was very funny. She said, so well, that's where not, that fruit... None of fruit, us got as far as the yeah. core. We were spitting it out oh. long before that. Yeah. He, uh, she said, so that's where all our wax fruit has been going. <laughs> <laughs> yep. There were some classics. Yeah. Did indeed. you see the, uh, the story about the, uh, the cell phone at the 1928 chapel? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Probably, uh, I think times. I received it at yeah. least 140 times. So. Yeah. Well, well, I've solved it. We apparently have a solution. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Yeah, I think so. Mystery solved. It's right up there in the second entry. It's the second feature. It's a mystery solved. Here are some compelling comments. And when you look at it, it's it's quite interesting. Uh, there's a link there. The German company Siemens had invented in 1916 a hearing aid mm-hmm. device. So did you see the picture of it? It was a well, little uh, handheld. People have been sending me your uh, oh, story okay. all day too. Yeah. So. Well, and I, I think I, whatever, I, and I get so many stories from your website, and I always think don't people realize that Jeff and Brad have a relationship and that we're, we're checking your page every day that we'd see it. But it's, it's nice that. people are thoughtful. Yeah. They want to be certain that we see it. Yeah. Well, just for those of you who haven't, do take a look at it. It was 1924 they came out with this device. Brilliant. And it had an earpiece on a cord. It wasn't a box. It wasn't a cell phone. The box part of it was actually had to be draped around your neck or somewhere where it was able to pick up sound. And it somehow, uh, they had a system back then where it was able to transmit that sound up into your ear through the little earpiece. But it wasn't a, mm-hmm. it wasn't a holding a device like 
an inch and a half by four inches long like a cell phone. It was just a, the guy's... No, or closer. like someone was saying that it couldn't be an ear trumpet. Well, you know, no. it, the conventional ear trumpet that we visualize is, you know, probably a foot and a half long and curved up. It really does look like a trumpet. So. Right. No, it is not that, but I, I, I think it is probably solved with those... Yeah, but here this, this now I there are some other things that are involved with that, but the person appears to be having a conversation. Right. There's no question right. about that. It doesn't look like someone's just listening, and there's no one around the person. That's one. When she turns yeah. or he turns toward the camera, you don't see the large box hanging out in front. Let's say mm-hmm. it's three by five or something. Mm-hmm. And then how do you explain the feet? You, those feet are about 18 inches long on that person. <laughs> I mean, it's I, I bizarre. I thought it was uh, the Wicked Witch. Wicked Witch, Wizard uh, of yes. Oz. Yeah, I did she too. She had feet like that. Yep. All right, back in a minute, gang. Hang on. We're back now. The winners are up on the homepage. All you have to do is click, and you'll see the Splash Art winners. I'd like to look at all the entries, and I'm not quite sure how to do that. Let's see. I'll see. Look at the bottom here. If you go to the bottom of the page, okay, well, the winners are there, so he's James has done a beautiful job of laying them out. Let's just go for the winners here. Okay, first place. And it'll be up on the rents.com homepage momentarily. And after we've looked at the winners, we'll look at the rest of them. Right. The, the winners are posted now. They are? They are. And if you go to the actual page where it says winners, click on that, you'll see the winners. And when you click on the small version of the art, a larger version will show yeah. up. And it's Just it's quite that. interesting. Now So the first placed winner is Vampires and Demon by Jack from England. Look at the detail on the work of that little boy. And what's behind him? Let's hope the vampire and demons... Ah, oh, they won't get it. That's they Nosferatu, won't. isn't it? That's Nosferatu. The true vampire appearance. Rather than the continental aristocrat, uh-huh. Bela Lugosi. It's such an interesting story, you know, with the Dracula. How F. N. Murnau want, couldn't get the rights. So he just went ahead and filmed his own version of Dracula, calling it Nosferatu. But it is the Dracula story. Going to England, the whole thing, aboard ship. Interesting, there'd be a thousand lawsuits today. If oh, at least there. look at the uh, look at the little creature on the left down behind the candle. Uh, look at the detail. Look at the teeth. And look at the, the Jack has done just a, a really a brilliant job of carrying the theme of the book and the story. Because you look behind the chair, and there are very large books behind Nosferatu. And the idea, of course, is that books contain Anything the mind can actually conjure up from the words. That's right. The marvelous depiction of how the mind transforms the printed page into creatures far scarier, really, than any motion picture can come up with. Mm -hmm. I think we've all had that experience as a child, reading it and scaring ourselves with our own images. Far more, I know what I used to imagine listening to 
inner sanctum when I was a kid. Uh, I've never seen the equal in motion picture yet. And slasher movies don't count. I mean, just mm -hmm. disemboweling someone is not frightening. It's too easy. Grotesque. <coughs> too easy. Chainsaws are too easy. Too easy. I mean, of course, we'd be frightened. We wouldn't want them leather-faced madman chasing us with a chainsaw. But we'd be more likely to pop him off with something. <laughs> No, if we were in that situation. But again, the um, the Friday the 13th and, and so forth. Uh, the true horror, you know, gets gets right inside you and, and tickles those parts of your psyche that, that you try to keep protected. Just as a good book can do, where you mm -hmm. describe and get you into it. And as I said, radio, radio in its day. Just a creak and a little bit of a voice and a moan. Wow, you're visualizing. Well, I think we can see that that's what this little boy. And I think it, you know, I just can't help thinking it looks like little Brad sitting there. Even with the stocking cap on and the, and the little snowball on top. I think it's a girl. You think it's a girl? Mm hmm. Well, you know, I, I do have my feminine side. You're. <laughs> Your hat, that hat has a little puff ball on top of it, and I. Yeah, what's your wrong hat with that? Would, nah, your hat would have had a Harley what's Davidson. What's wrong with that? You had had a Harley Davidson logo on it. No, no, I did not. Or Ford. I think it's a cute little girl. Well, it might you wouldn't be. wear stockings like that. Did you wear stockings like that? Of course. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Are you me. kidding? Sorry. And and we had to have. That's the way little kids dressed in the 30s. And then there was a little garter we wore that we'd click the top of the sock onto. Excuse me? Absolutely, we wore socks like that. Now, wait, are you... You're ser I hear in your voice a tone of seriousness. It is a tone of seriousness. You know, it took an hour just to get dressed. You Do you know? know that if a little boy... Let's say that that one's around 10-ish, 11. Went to school now with socks held up by a garter. Well, never mind. Well, no, I know it's completely different. But, but you remember, we, we had to walk, you know, uh, four miles to school all uphill in the snow. If it weren't for you, there would have never have been a cardboard industry. <laughs> in the bottom of your, your little shoes with... That's Such right. Such big holes in them. Stuffed old no, not cardboard my shoes, in there. Just, just my socks. That's amazing. But no, no, that's that's the way little boys dressed in the 30s. Well, they some of the bigger anyway, boys are dressing like that it's now. It's a cute little kid anyway, whether a you boy or a girl. It's a great and piece. The grotesqueries around him her uh, are wonderfully crafted by our first prize winner. Congratulations, yeah. Jack. wonder what Jack's last name is, being that he's from England. Starts with an R, perhaps? Nah. Okay. That's a dandy. We're going to have that up on rents.com shortly. That's our, our winner for this year, so he'll get his truckload of prizes, and we do thank him very much. Thank you, Jack. Salute. He's probably asleep now over there. I think it's about 5, 5. Boy, it's almost 6 a.m. Uh, okay, second place winner. The Witching Hour. Now, this uh, I, is this is a very unique rendering. Uh, I think it's uh, superb. Superb. And we have the whole gang there. The little rascals. Uh, no. <laughs> These are not the little rascals. These Seven are dwarves? Little monsters. Uh, the little monsters. They're, yeah. they're all, the gang is all there, all right. Look at that. Bats yeah. hanging underneath it. I don't, this is a strange one. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if, uh, what the clock is sitting on. I, I guess it's just floating uh, in, mm. in the ether. And mm. the, 
satanic tale is the pendulum and the clock. It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty creepy. And I think it captures so much of the essence of mm-hmm. Halloween down through the centuries. It is an historic piece. And those are. Yeah, I, I read it. Well, it's Charles we, Dickens' we, we, suit that that guy on the right is wearing. Exactly. And the, the uh, cheerleader on the left is wearing no suit. No suit at all. Also a Dickinsonian rendering. Mm hmm. It's quite a witch's nose. And the fellow at the top with the enormous wings is the big man himself, Alistair Crowley's so. alter ego. I think that's Sir Nunos himself. Mm. I, yeah, I'd love to see that. Hmm? I just have a fiber in the wings. I mean, it's a mar- yeah. marvelous detail. No, it, it's you, uh, you can look at this if uh, if you like grotesqueries, which some of us do, and I think that's what earned its uh, second place prize. Go look at the tentacles. I actually would love to see it with a red, deep red background. I think it would it would jump even more. It would be marvelous. But I uh, mean, you look at the blood veins in exactly. the exactly, yeah, king. Demon. No, the de- yeah, the detail is amazing. That's really a, a very talented amazing. artist, as is our first. And I don't understand the techniques of of uh, digital art like James are peerless webmaster does but he mm-hmm. was very impressed with this as well yeah, uh, I think I, all I, of you will agree we have just some really uh, superb uh, first and second place winners this year that is really amazing and it is down through the ages yeah all right, that's we're... the history of Halloween in one sense there the uh, clever artist name I doubt if his really name is Dr. Acula. Dr. Acula? Yeah. My chiropractor. Clever synonym. Er, it's not a synonym. Name or of my, synonym. Maybe my, it is a synonym for him. I don't know. My chiropractor's name. Don't knock it. Uh, I'm, I'm not knocking it. All right. Well, congratulations. Just, to Dracula. Or Dr. Acula. Doctor Doctor Acula. Doctor Acula. All right, we'll come back and look at uh, a very unusual first in the 52 years we've been doing this program. Next, as we continue. winners, Jeff and Brad's 52nd annual Halloween broadcast to the world. 53rd. 53rd. 53rd annual Halloween broadcast. Wait another 10 minutes, it'll be 54. (laughs) Uh, All right, what we had to do this year was we have a third place tie. We could not, as I said, shots were fired, but they were not. Things got got a little vicious for a while, but... uh... Being people of honor, we uh, 
decided the only honorable thing to do was to have a tie. So Would we, you accept that explanation of a, Well, except for the holes in my roof and the blown out window, yes. But there's no hard feelings, uh, are there? Are no, there? I have insurance. It's all right. Okay. I didn't know you were such a good shot at 30 miles an hour driving by. Really? No, I should have I should have that. demonstrated it earlier. Yeah. Maybe then. Well, anyway, yeah. anyway, All right. we came okay. to a peaceful resolution of a tie. Let's take a look at the one on the left by Roxanne. Roxanne, congratulations. Uh, I'm, I'm at a loss on how to pronounce this. Not Roxanne, I got that figured out. <laughs> On my own, too, I might add. But Sweet Ruth. What the hell is a Sweet Ruth? Well, I I, think, I know what a Baby Ruth is. Yeah, I I, I know think, what a Sweet uh, Tooth is. Yeah. Well, Ruth must have been sweet, too, I think. We see the little mask that she was wearing. And uh, this is obviously some golem-type creature that goes out and... Ransacks the trick or treat bags because we're the ground is covered with candy yes, and caramel not. apples. Working for the FDA, trying to save the kitties. Yes. Uh, it's very good. Look at the detail work. All right, look at the ground. Look at the shadows. Look at those magnificent black toenails. But look at all the individual candies. Look at the mask. Look at the rock. Look at the de look at the artwork. This could not be excluded it's too good uh, it's just yeah. the flowers the it's gorgeous and uh the rendering is is superb yes my precious yeah yeah i knew you were going to do that <laughs> so uh okay congratulations to roxy sorry we don't even know each other roxanne no. and uh familiar. I'm sorry, I just get carried away. It's like family here, and I know uh, all the apples that are got caramel dripping on them, and, and it's just neat. That's a greeting card classic, and let's hope Roxanne didn't scan it off a greeting card. <laughs> Come to think of it. No, 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 no. Roxanne is a very old and honorable name. All right. She well, wouldn't do anything like that. No, but it's a it's really good, whatever it is. So congratulations, you're winning a full share, a full third prize. We're going to duplicate everything thanks to Brad's publishing company. Little do they know, but they're going to come through. <laughs> and uh, so Roxanne, a great contribution. Congratulations and thank you. And now we move right of Roxanne to something by... Intrinsic. And corn it's, stalker. Yeah. Now, what's the deal with the corn stalker? You being from the corn belt of the universe, the known universe. Oh, you don't go out in the cornfield. You're told ever since you are old enough to walk, old enough to be frightened half to death, you are told by your parents that the corn stalker is out in the cornfield. And you better not go out or he'll eat ya. And we see that the, some little boy or girl didn't listen to mommy and daddy because this red-eyed corn stalker's mouth is dripping blood. Gee. And as his friend, the rat, kind of like his familiar on his shoulders, kind of like the moth man in appearance. So uh huh. So this is one conception of the corn stalker. Any little child told that <laughs> as, his, as his own conception of the corn stalker. But this, this sums it up pretty well. This sums it up, kind of cross between Lord knows what, some kind of creature, some kind of plant, some kind of... So, I mean, we were told, and I told my children, you know, the corn stalker. Don't go in. And, of course, the obvious device is if a child goes into a cornfield, I mean, it is the one way One-way trip, right? Yeah. I mean, well, you will, I mean, set aside the corn stalker, which is a device to keep children out of the cornfield, of course. 
because going into the cornfield as a child, I mean, the child could be in there for hours or days before you would find him, even with people searching. I mean, because you, you can't see him, you can't hear him, the corn is up high. So the corn stalker is a traditional device to keep the kitties out of the cornfield. And we all had our image, and this is pretty close to the one I thought was waiting for me if I ever went out there. <laughs> Look at the rat up on top. Yeah, uh, like his familiar. Pensively his holding his tail. Uh-huh. Cute. And the scarecrow, obviously part of the... Uh, Mm -hmm. The cabal there running things at night. That's right. Very good. Good word. It's a good is... word. You've been uh, reading again. Cabal? Mm hmm. C A B L E? <laughs> <laughs> I know my words. Shucks. Oh, you do. Shucks. I Somebody know. called you're, me you're the a, other day, huh? Uh, hmm? You're a master of a wordplay. Somebody called the other day, and he's a long haul truck driver. And he said, uh, This JF? And I, yeah, I can, may I help you? I said, who's this? He said, Beal. <laughs> I said, who? Beal. <laughs> <laughs> he said, like William. <laughs> ah, yeah, I got it. I got it. B-E-E-L. I mean, that's what he said. Right, but right. He, I guess he didn't. He, he was, It was Bill, but... Damned if it didn't sound like B E E L to me, but nice guy. And uh, anyway, some of you are saying, "Well, what's a long haul trucker doing calling him?" He was delivering oh. something that was brought here from the eastern part of the country, like kind of like UPS stuff. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, I've, we've received some of our greatest stories. They're out there at night. They're out there with, looking at the ditches. They're up there looking at the sky. They're out mm -hmm. there looking at the prairies, the plains, the desert, and they see things, and not because they have been imbibing, because that would be very foolish for a long-haul truck driver. Right. But they see a lot of things. We've had just oh, excellent reports. UFO reports drivers. especially, uh, things yeah. running across the road, big things right. on two legs. By the way, uh, there are enough... Wonderful submissions in our art contests to bring out an entire line of Halloween uh, gift cards. And th these are actually better than most. These are superb. And so you people who are involved with, with doing the artwork and the drawing, keep it up. And I, I would urge you to try to market your your Halloween cards to greeting card companies. And Absolutely. You deserve the recognition and, and whatever profit you can derive because it's true talent. This is really good stuff. So we have four winners this year. And, well, uh, let, just as a word of encouragement, Jeff, excuse me for interrupting you, hmm. but Bill Oliver, one of our winners in years past, uh -huh. is now doing exactly that. He has a line of cards. Very mostly. good the monster card and the angel cards and so mm -hmm. forth. So it can be done, Good. all you artists, because one of the former winners is doing exactly that. He has an arrangement, and, and uh, the, his images now are on cups and cards and calendars, uh, the whole works. Well, so that these, is a very, very yeah. definite possibility, as Jeff said. These are four top flight artists obviously that uh you can see why we had to expand uh and it was tough to leave some of the others out don't don't uh very tough for a minute think very that tough. this was a, a you know just a, a cakewalk it was it was difficult we had but these four were just deserved to be up there or they wouldn't be there i guess that's the best way to to sum it up and they were just but a little bit tough. it was very hard all right, we've got a break. Broken, broken chairs, glasses, yeah. in the wind, windows. I'm sorry about that. Well, you didn't have to burn rubber on my driveway. That was the part that... Yeah. Well, I was afraid you were going to shoot at me. I had to get no, out of there. No, no, no. All right, click here to see all of the splash entries. When we come back after the break, we're going to walk down the art gallery with you. So click on that if you would. And we will take a look and honor the other people who sent in uh, materials as well. Okay, back in just a couple minutes with us.
Okay, ready for a walk? I'm ready. Okay. Our 53rd annual... Still 53? Mm-hmm. Okay. Walk down the art gallery. All right, at the top here from Jessica... Licciardello. How was that? That's very good. I got Jessica right. I think you got the other right. Peace, love, and happy Halloween to you, too, Jess. Thank Very you. Very cute. Very, Very cute. Sweet, kind, good message. Now, here's another theme to the right of that. We kind of have to hurry up here, I guess. The Phantom yeah. Car visits Steiger Castle. Now, you can click on these thumbnails and get the big the big size screen image. Uh, very well done. Good idea. We've talked, of course, Brad has about the Phantom Car stories forever on the program. And uh, nicely done. I I think I would have a darker sky maybe. Looks a little too sanguine mm -hmm. for the witch, but mm -hmm. and maybe a moon up there. But uh, other than that, look at the size of the wolves. <laughs> Those good. are big ones. Yeah. yeah. Now again, the peace and love one. That that would be a perfect card. You know, to make into a card. Not quite so scary. That that'd be a good one. You know, a great one for kids and and younger people non-threatening it's cute and it's peace I and love I couldn't agree more They, in fact a, virtually every one of our entries uh, could conceivably find its way to a card I mean this one mm -hmm. uh, no, no doubt none okay we'll go down to the second row and uh, revenant I don't know what the word revenant means uh, revenential uh, reverential yeah, one, one who comes back from the one, dead like a vampire it's not if Vampires you're are called revenants in some no. European countries. I thought if you were just re someone who was reverential, made you irreverent. No. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. By uh, Pancho's partner, Cisco. Mm-hmm. Now, if, can you can you name that TV series? Pancho and Cisco. Cisco? Kid? That's it. The Cisco Kid. Thank you, Cisco, for that. And yes, played by the inimitable, one of a Duncan kind, Ronaldo. and Leo Carrillo, playing hmm? Pancho. Leo Pancho. Carrillo used to take his horse and ride on the Santa Barbara Fiesta Parade, and he'd go right into the bars on his horse and drink <laughs> while he was seated. No, it's true. He had a ball. He was a character. Well, that's when Hollywood characters were larger than life, when they weren't these horrible horrible digital fraud products that they are now. That's There are some good ones. I don't, I know. We always speak in generalities. All right. Nibiru is coming. This is the planet that was pictured, they think, in the uh, mm -hmm. ancient Sumerian drawing. Right. Using the drawings there. Yeah. Uh, this gets into Zechariah Sitchkin, which rests Sit in peace. Yeah, Zechariah Sitchin passed away. and uh, October 9th. Yeah, well, he kept it uh, rather When uh, we heard, we thought, you know, how, why did it wait so long? But I guess the family wanted its privacy, which we must yeah. respect. Yep. Now, I'm not sure what the woman on the right is up to, what, what that is in her mouth, but it looks like if you've ever opened a can of... Uh, cranberry sauce and p dump the whole can out. <laughs> it looks like she's tried to swallow the whole can of cranberry sauce and it got yeah, stuck and there. Not, not to make light of this effort, but I had the same thought, cranberry sauce or beets, the canned beets that you Yeah. Okay, okay, well, whatever. All right. Whatever. It's, it's good. It's that's good. Just hope, I guess that's what's going to happen to us if Nibiru shows up. We'll all be I choking guess. on cranberry we sauce. We will be part of the course. Okay. The uh, other Zergub mm -hmm. elephant grass eyes, there's another uh, cornfield monster, I think. <laughs> and quite well done. Quite well yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. It was cute. So that's a that's an innocuous one. And that one you could almost put on a, a dog lead and take home. Mm-hmm. All right. Now another one from Jack from England. And again, very well done again. But um, kind of specific and, and kind of uh, movie posterish, and we felt that it just wasn't in the same league 
as the one that won first place, his vampires and demons. But again, very well done. Yeah. Well, the atmosphere of that one was timeless. This is we, we've, as Brad said, this has been. We've seen this kind. Of, you get the sense of feeling in various Hollywood films. And, right. Uh, that's not right. to demean his artistic talent. At no, all. not at all. No, it's very good, and uh, it, it's excellent. I don't know what else we can say. These ETs are not, uh, not. Wouldn't want to spend any time near them. Very unfriendly and uh, fearsome. Uh, next up yeah. is Confrontation G- by great A.J. For shock, Rainer. Yeah, great for shock, especially when you blow it up. See it and, and truly appreciate it more. You, you see more detail, of course, when it's blowing up. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, the eyes kind of pop out at you. And, right. and uh, Again, it, it's a nice shocker. Very well done. She needs an orthodontist. All right, we'll be right Talk back. Is, is one of those uh, very strange ones, but uh, intriguing. Intriguing. Some spider caught some monster down in your basement, I guess. Good one, though, Ronald Trippy. Good. Caught. Good job. All right, back in a minute as we continue. That's the strangest Halloween music I've heard. Yeah. Not quite the monster match, the thriller. Let's try this one. Halloween in Japan. All right. Now, we are looking at the splash art entries, which can be found at the bottom of the page of the splash art winters. Winners. The winners. If you look at rents.com, you'll see winners and click on that. Art winners. Roll to the bottom of the page. Take the link there, and you'll come up with all of the entries this year. And if you scroll Great down entries. about here. Yeah, they are. All right, we're down at... Uh, mad Science. A mad Science. Always fun to play with uh, magazine formats. Uh, redesigning humans. Boy, they, they're doing that, folks. No doubt about it. So a little bit of reality there. Not quite as frightening as this may have been, you know, 30 or 50 years ago. They're doing all kinds of genetic things. So, sitting right next to our, our tie for third place corn stalker. Suzanne, thank you for the entry and the time. Very well done. Very well done. Next up Night on... Nightlife, I, I hmm? liked very much, too. Nightlife was close. It was close. It, uh, it was very close. We couldn't have... Too many ties. Where you know, two is a tie, three is well, something else. Both by intrinsic, and of course we had two by Jack from England. And yeah, we just felt that one was just a little better than the other. And although nightlife is very good, and when you blow it up, you see a lot more detail, and mm-hmm. very good. Now the the one next to it, uh, untitled by anonymous, that. That kind of gives you the creeps if you get into it. Uh, we know we talk about Harlequin, and we talk about the clown, and we talk about. Uh, so that was, that's very intriguing. Could also I, I wish. I wish there would have been, you know, it would have been larger, or excuse me, I wish the scope of it would have been larger, so so that we had kind of a 
as we do with so many of the others, just kind of a mini story, you know, to go with it. But well, you the, could have uh, named it uh, Anonymous by Untitled and gotten away yeah, with yeah, it, too. Could have done that. But but it's very it's very provocative, and I, I just wish there would have been... I know, I'm not trying to tell an artist when a work is complete and when it isn't, but... Um, yes, you are. To, it, it, well, I am. I am. I started <laughs> as an art major in college. I mean, So did so, Adolf um, Hitler. Pardon? So did Adolf Hitler. Yeah, well, I I hope there are no other similarities. None. You shaved your mustache. It's fine. You grew the whole no. beard in, so now we we can definitely tell it's you. Definitely tell it's me. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Next up, uh, but a little c- constructive idea here and there never hurts any artist or writer. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had to rewrite paragraphs for Brad. No, never <laughs> mind. That's another story. <laughs> Happy to do it. Just sometimes at 2 a.m., it's a tough call to answer. Don't but be you, afraid. Um, hmm. You always man up. I do. Well, I got those striped <laughs> socks and the garter belt and all that. So <laughs> you notice gotta, that's the new phrase. Got to man up. <laughs> don't Put your be, man pants on and man no, up. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you hear that? Man up. <laughs> that's all the. Uh, you, you hear it uh, on, on all the sound bites. That, that's become the big thing oh, no. for a women contestants this year to turn to their opponent and say, man up, which if they would realize <laughs> it, it's the worst thing they could say because they're saying, you know, you have to be a man if you're going to be. I mean, someone yet, should on point the other out s- to them. But obviously yeah. some consultant somewhere has told yeah. them that's, that's going to take your opponent off guard if you tell them to man up. When they don't realize, they're saying, well, obviously, they should tell them to woman up, or I'm going to woman up. Well, that would way, throw me more, is to say woman yeah. up, not man up. Well, now follow they're, this. they're, in essence, saying only a man can do the job, and that's not what they mean at all. But, but see, a little constructive criticism does help. Is it my turn? Your turn. Man up, in this day and age... The way the average Caucasoid male is portrayed is more feminine than most women. Well, there's that point, too. Thank you. I knew I'd get in there somehow. So well, man up you know. saying to another woman means be a wimp. Just be a weak male. Not a macho Any, male. Anyway, it's a total nonsensical thing to say in a, pub, in a political debate. Either yes. way you want to play. Either way Any you want to play. It's absurd. Well, politics is absurd. Don't be afraid. I just came to wish you a happy Halloween. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Eugenio <laughs> Candida. Thank you. Very well done. And I wonder where the ink for the the uh, pen knife came from. Or the paint. Must be a, a ballpoint pen knife. That's Where'd good. I see that. Well, what's he writing? He's, he's written on the wall with a knife. Oh, 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 oh. Where's oh. the ink? The guy in the bed doesn't appear to be bleeding, so. Well, there must be a victim in the hall. Or See? In the alley or somewhere, because that's a mean-looking jacket. Leonard. Good job. Okay. Good job, Eugenio. Might be Eugenio. No, he's from Brazil. All right. How do you know? Because yeah. he sends little things from time to time. He's a very talented cartoonist. All right. Next up is... Uh... Yuck. A... Yeah, that is the yuck. <laughs> I don't know if there's much to say about that one. It's kind of No, not much to say about that. Yeah. Well, pick your poison there, folks. Wow. All right, it's a uh, that is creative. It's unusual. Okay. Corpse Bride by C. D. Miller, I think, is much better, a much better entry, and uh, I I really like that one. I I looked at that a great deal. It is uh, a little on the gruesome side. But it's certainly with the ghost wolf and the mist and the 
Corpse Bride, it, it certainly sends a shiver, and that's what we want these entries to do. So good job on that, CD. Good job on the Corpse Bride. All right. Shall I let you handle the next one? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what to say about the next one. Scott is obviously giving expression to his political leanings. Those who lean his direction will uh, find it has uh, merit and certain humor, and and those who lean the other way will probably think it's uh, disrespectful. So it you know, just depends. That's pretty on. tough to disrespect that. Never mind. Okay. Count, Count Orlock. Orlock. Well rendered, and this is an interesting t- artistic technique. I'm not, it tends to flow, there's a fluidity to it. And a mm-hmm. softness. It looks like a vel- one of those velvet, airbrushed uh, kind of styles. It's it's not, but uh, well done. This is another good one. Yeah, we we like that one. We like that one. And then of course we have the two winners, two of the winners. And uh, here's another good one uh, by Forever Mitt. Right. Uh, Looked at that a long time and often, and uh, since I am a werewolf of file, if there would have been, I think, a little more, maybe if he'd been leaping on a victim or something, but it is very well done and shows uh, great talent, as does his one beside it. No rest for the wicked. Looked at that a lot, like like both of them, really. Good job on both of them. I I thought this was first rate art. Uh, something I don't know. It's something I don't know what. I see you're the werewolf expert. I'm just not quite sure if this had been in a a different setting. Yes. Might have had setting. different impact uh, entirely. I don't know, but it's it's very well done. Uh, it seems like part of a piece to me. He's also like, yeah, yeah. Okay, I can see that. Rest for the wicked is a little more complete. They're coming out of a dungeon wherever those tapor type of zombie creatures are held. I thought that that was a little more uh, had had greater fulfillment to it, and looked at that a lot. I mean, that was, uh, as we say, they're all good. They all have merit. They all have merit. Trying to pick, as as we've indicated several times, is really tough. Got brains? (laughs) Interesting. I guess guess the zombies after our brains. Well, these are kind of, that's a... uh... A Butterfinger candy wrapper colored got brains. Yeah, I, I wasn't quite certain of that. It's uh, it's kind of just more of a pop treatment. Right, right. But uh, again, and these all require thought and input and manifestation and, and in some kind of an artistic form format. Next is uh, Roxanne's uh, superb entry. Uh, the art in that. You look at the detail, folks. Just that's what you want to look at. Blow it up and look at it. And uh, we're going to get through these real quickly here. Mm-hmm. The haunted white house, as in White House, by mm-hmm. Chewy Bees. Kind of a interesting idea. I'm not sure about the upstairs red eyes and the crack cocaine pipe. But whatever. Whatever. And Eternal question was very provocative. <laughs> we don't know if that skeleton is praying for the tornado to leave humans alone or to take toll and uh, give him some more company. But we have these eerie skulls floating around him. And that uh, the red, good use of red there, and as I say, the read of the life force being subverted by that tornado and of course the ultimate affront to the life force is death in the cemetery so 
Very interesting. Buzz Funky, I would guess that was pronounced, or Funk. Uh, very interesting. I thought that I found that very provocative. All right, Wade Rasmussen didn't come up with a title for his. I might be able to figure out why, but he's that's a kind of a gruesome. Yeah, it's pretty gruesome. Torture See the bodies hanging in the back, and yeah, we don't we don't know if these creatures go out and feed and and bring their victims back, and we do see intestines hanging from the victims uh, hoisted by their arms. It's uh, it's certainly a shocker. It's certainly something we asked for. Was a good good shocking Halloween. Themes. Yeah. We got it there. All right. As we do with Western vampires. Yeah. Yep. You got everything but a Harley there, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. I suppose. You can see them sitting on one. It's. He looks like he's. No, I think that's this. He's bow legged from riding his vampire horse. We've seen, it seems like very, we've seen very interesting. Well, well done. Vampire Just, horse. Uh, again, too. Uh, a little confusing. We have a skeleton in the background. I think if we had a victim in the background, again, it would have made uh, more of a whole, more more of a whole piece. Uh, this seems again like it's uh, sort of the foreground of a of a larger piece. You could have been an art critic. Pretty good. Pretty good. Well, thank you, gang, all of you, for your efforts and your time. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, and these will, of course, be housed permanently on, on Brad and Sherry's page at rents.com, and you can go look at your work anytime. All the entries from each year are up there, as are the winners. And we are very much uh, pleased with this year's submissions, as always. They're just excellent. Terrific. We got away from the uh, too much of the political stuff this year, and I was surprised, frankly, because the state of the nation is so bad and and so it's not. Well, good. I, I was pleased though because that's you know that's that's such. An I was easy pleased target. too. It is an easy target. We've never had more easy targets. No, no, and I and I'm proud of the way that they uh, exercised. You know the their creativity and we we said you know we wanted more of the old fashioned halloween uh and allowing of course modernity to enter in but uh, i i think these were excellent selection and i want to congratulate as i know you do every every artist who submitted an entry i mean i would be hard pressed to do anything reasonable I'm, i don't have artistic ability has never had. I look at some oh. of these masterworks like our winners, and I just, I'm amazed. James Neff, of course, in his own right, is a, a brilliant artist, too. He just never brilliant. has time to do it. Brilliant. Got some classics. No, and I want to thank uh, Lady Sherry for her also giving her opinion. And as I said, we, we were at these till, till sun up. Of course, that's when we go to bed. It's safe then for us to go to you know, bed. There's wooden, wooden beds with the lids on them. Yeah. No, Freak. no, no. She'll get upset if she hears you say that. Well, it's just for effect. It's just atmosphere. <laughs> Not for real, Sherry. Okay, well, that's it for the year on the art, and that was really fun because we got... Well, it was tough, but the top four... Clearly, just we, we, we couldn't leave one of those off. There's just you know, it might have been a few percentage points separating number four from number five, but somewhere, somehow, you got to make a decision. And that's uh, I think we can't, those are all excellent. Those excellent. top four, they just don't get much better. And the short story or the story entries weren't any easier at all. All right, if anything. Well, they were equally difficult, let's put it that way. All right, and we'll talk about those. Brad's going to read all of them in the next hour. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> we will dis- we'll discuss all of them. All right, back in a minute.
Our number three, it's time for the It Was a Dark and the Stormy Night segment. We're listening now to readings of the top true, capital T, ghost story winners. And if you are interested in this, it's right on the home page in the big banner. And James has put up the three winners. All the entrants are up there if you uh, want to read them. They'll, they'll be posted as well. Now, the the guidelines for the stories were the same as, as always. How many words? I think we said around 1,500. Something like that. Okay, I mean, so... As, as, as a max. As a right. Max. Right. It's hard to read when there are big paragraphs. Keep that in mind, folks. Yeah. It's best like our Ghostly Soldier, which is the first placed grand prize winner. The second graph is enormous. It should be three graphs. It's just mm-hmm. easier for people to read, and that doesn't demean in any way, shape, or form from the fact that you won. And it is very well done. Dan sent it in, and uh, Brad, the master of reading, is going to do the honors and read this story to us. So let's go. Let's go. I'll probably read it in a little differently than it might have been written, but what, I will read Back it. to front? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> All right, let's go. The following is a true story that happened to me and my family on a vacation trip to the Little Bighorn National Battlefield. My wife, kids, and I went out to the Little Bighorn in Currow Agency, Montana, in 1992. I have a great uncle named Miles Keogh who rode with Custer and was the commander of Company I. I wanted to see just where he died. I had to explain to the rangers, those who were guarding the battlefield, the places where you can't go, who I was and how I was related to Miles. And after I told them in detail of my relationship, they allowed me, and only me, to go where he died and do a rubbing on his stone. When I finished, we decided to go further into the battlefield. It was about 11 a.m., 105, as we drove out to reno Bentine Ridge Battlefield on the south end of the site. We were the only ones foolish enough to go out there in that heat, and there was not a soul in sight. When we parked and got out and started to snoop around for a while, A soldier in full uniform came over to the ridge from the direction of the river. We started talking with him about the battle, and the kids were asking questions, and he... Let me see now. He looked wiped, bush tired. Wait wait a minute, I just moved it up and lost the one. The one soda. we started talking. He looked bushed. So I went to the cooler and gave him a Pepsi. He looked at it very strangely, but didn't open it. We explained our relationship to Miles, and the soldier started telling us things that only a person who knew Miles could know, such as Miles was a spy, an informer, assassin for President Grant. Grant hated Custer for a slide at the end of the Civil War, and Custer was going to run for president after the battle. Then the soldier told us how Uncle Miles was loved by his men because he shared his liquor. This was something I'd always wondered about, but I didn't want to ask him if Uncle Miles was a mean drunk. Miles supposedly had numerous casks of whiskey with the pack train. How Custer was shot. He told us how Custer was shot as he tried to cross the Little Bighorn in a flanking maneuver. The soldier told us that Uncle Miles was a crack shot with a rifle. And how after they, Custer's battalion, was pushed up onto Custer Hill 
by the Indians, Miles tried to save his own company, but before he left, knowing it was a futile effort to escape, he put a round into Custer's head for getting all of Miles' troopers killed. Suddenly the soldier said he had to get going. We thanked him. He turned, went back over the ridge, still carrying the can of Pepsi, and out of sight, we went back to the car. I thought that was pretty interesting, but didn't give it too much thought. And then I started to wonder how he could have known all this. Because... Everyone that went with Custer was dead. And the story couldn't be told unless that soldier was there himself. We'll never forget him. Honestly, the air seemed to be charged with electricity like heat lightning when he came into view. His eyes were piercing like he was looking right through me. His voice sounded hollow, distant, with only a slight drawl. He was a sergeant. His uniform was dusty, dirty, and worn. He wore a kepi, which is um, uh, like the little cap the Union soldiers wore, sure. flat on top and mm-hmm. under the brim. He wasn't clean-shaven, but he wasn't bearded. He looked withered and raw. He seemed awestruck by my wife and kids, like he had a wife and kids and missed them very much. If he was a reenactor... He could have won an Oscar with his performance. He never acted or sounded like a ranger in the living history mode. He just referred to each area as over there, and not by its common battlefield name, the battlefield name it would have today. Of course, at the time, it didn't have names. And he didn't point with his finger, but just like a Native American, he pointed with his nose, throwing his head back and using his nose as a pointer. The area around Reno Benteen and the path to Uncle Miles' marker stone was the most electric-spilled places I've ever been. I could almost hear the war cries of the Sioux warriors. Not spooky, but this sounds stupid or crazy. Almost like the old Twilight Zone episode about the National Guardsmen to go back to the time of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. I myself am a very believable Civil War reenactor. But that soldier never strayed out of character. I've never seen anything as authentic as he was. That's something that the wife, the kids, and I still talk about. And everything I've said is very true. Submitted by Dan. I think this one, because of its honesty, its directness, its using actual personages, and the fact that this man was a Civil War reenactor. It really seems as though they encountered a restless spirit there in that battlefield. And certainly there are so many reports, you know, in places like Gettysburg and, and Who, Antietam and exactly. Little Bighorn, yeah. where the spirits still walk. Well, he was a Civil War, is a Civil War reenactor. Right. You're not going to fool somebody like that. No. That's why I thought it was especially uh, a good story, because of that. And these are true stories, folks. These are not fiction. These are true ghost stories. I think what we had this time, and I hope no one takes offense by this, but the stories this time all had the ring of authenticity. Hmm. Uh, They are written in, and again, don't take offense, (laughs) but... Uh, they well, are, they weren't proofread. They, they weren't pushed through a spell checker and a grammar checker and no, all that. They were just no, written they like were people. Not. No, and they there were are grammatical what, errors. Yeah. There are spelling errors, and um, written in like you say, uh, not not. We've in the past, and we've never said professionals couldn't enter, but we've had in the past, I think, some that were obviously written by professional writers. They're very right. smooth. No, these very were crafted. written. They're very raw and honest. And uh, Raw fascinating. And honest, that's the yeah. word. All right, let me start on this next one before we have to take a break here. And just, maybe just can... let me tell you one yeah. thing. Go ahead. Okay, this is unusual in that Bluey is actually telling the story. Bluey Morgan. Okay, yeah, I got that. In January 1977, two well-known musicians from Cairn, Australia. Bluey Morgan and Gary Ward were driving an old 1960 British-made van carrying Gary with his double bass home to the Gold Coast and Bluey with his drum kit to Melbourne. 
as both of them were looking for work due to the lack of it in the tropical city of Cairns. I had been driving all day, so we pulled in to get an evening meal at a hotel in Rockhampton, about halfway between Cairns and Brisbane, as the rain was beginning to come down pretty heavy. Whilst having dinner, we were talking to some locals who recognized us from a few past concerts in Rockhampton and in various bands over the years. We were also told that strange things had been happening on the road ahead and in the local area, and that we should be careful whilst traveling in this area. So we also decided not to drink alcohol whilst eating and to keep our wits about us, something musicians learn well. We were then introduced to the hotel owner who told us of many weird traffic accidents with some mysterious disappearances, strange lights and sounds in and around the areas we were about to drive through. These stories were apparently very well known and also recognized and recorded by the local people. Needless to say, we were not prepared to stay overnight either, thinking that their stories were merely a ploy to get more overnight customers to stay at the hotel, so we decided to press on in the rain anyhow. About 40 minutes after leaving the hotel and whilst the van lights were on, high beam, we noticed a chap standing at the edge of the road in the rain. He was clothed in a check shirt, jeans, and straw cowboy type hat and was also waving for a lift or a ride. We immediately looked at each other, didn't know what to think, said nothing but began slowing down. We were also remembering what was told to us by the locals and the owner of the pub, so we decided to slow down, drive past and check him out, and then decide whether or not to give him a lift. We noticed one strange thing in particular, and that was quite clearly he was not wet. We did not stop, and to this day I still feel very odd about the situation. A few miles down the road I felt bad about this man standing in the rain and what he must have thought when we didn't stop, but at the same time I also remembered that after passing him we could no longer see him in the rearview mirror, so we thought he had ducked back under a tree maybe and Never gave it another thought. Settling back to the drive ahead of us, we began conversing about work, maybe, at the Gold Coast. Now, I want everyone to picture and remember this. There were only five cars on the road ahead, coming toward us in all of this time, period. But at no time did any vehicles go past our vehicle, at all, traveling in the same direction. Forty or so minutes later, we noticed the rain was now becoming much heavier so the wiper blades went to top speed, and the demister was turned on. However, not more than ten minutes into this heavier rain, there he was again. The same man, with the same hat, the same clothes, the same wave, standing at the edge of the road, but this time he had a grin on his face, and he was very much still, as dry as a bone. Hey, man, we're in the middle of nowhere. Where had this man come from? He never passed us on the road. He never got out of the clothes he was wearing because they were still dry. Gary freaked out. I freaked out. I also had no idea that an old van could actually move so fast. I think we set a new land speed record for the old vans, and and we never spoke during that time, never looked at each other for at least 25 more minutes. We just watched that bloody road ahead till the next town, every inch of it. When we arrived arrived at the Gold Coast, we said nothing to anyone at all. Who would believe us? For at least a whole year, nothing was said by either Bluey or Gary. To anybody. Till I, Bluey, approached the police to basically find out whether or not this incident should have been reported Whilst cross-checking the dates with incidents happened, we discovered there were two mysterious disappearances the same week we traveled on that very same road. The police were all of a sudden wanting every piece of information we could give. It seems that the chap we both saw hitchhiking on the road had been killed in a crash 13 years before we actually saw him. 
About 10 years later, the conversation arose once again because two people were found dead in their car on the same stretch of road in the pouring rain with no signs of an accident anywhere. Even as I write this, I still get goosebumps thinking of what events may have taken place if we had stopped. Recently, I watched an Australian movie called Wolf Creek, and the goosebumps began again. Most people I know will only travel that stretch of road in daylight, me included. Submitted by Bluey there Morgan. You are. Good job. Good and, job. Uh, obviously, something's going on, folks. Yeah. Something very strange. He's a, Wolf he's a, Creek is a very frightening movie, but it, it doesn't deal with ghosts. It deals more with, uh, uh, like Leatherface, an individual who captures young people and tortures them and so forth. But didn't he do a very, talk show? Leatherface? Pardon me? Didn't he do a talk show? Leatherface? I don't know. I don't well, know everyone's doing a talk show now. I, th- I, I think know. he just grunts a little bit. I don't think That's what I mean. Thing. That's exactly what I mean. <laughs> You know, and pretty soon, every other person in this country, what's left of it, will have their own internet radio show. Oh, yeah. yeah. I guarantee it. And what do you do? I, I've got an internet the... radio show. How many people listen? Well, my, my, see, my grandmother and mm-hmm. my aunt. Mm-hmm. And I listen to it in reruns. And that's about it. But never mind. God knows what you're saying. And the problem <laughs> is they're diluting. And I'm not saying they shouldn't, can't, you know, more power to them. But when they start to to take up the time of what of what some very important people have to say, and a lot of people are real nice and they don't want to say no, they tend to dilute the guest pool, shall we say, and tire it mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and I'm not saying anything about my program at all. Uh, just just the way it is. Oh no, and like you say, you can't say one can't have them, but. Just as anyone can write a book these days with the marvelous technology we have, anyone can have a talk show. Well, you so get I calls can see you. all the now time. Now I understand your question, whether Leatherface had a talk show or not. Okay, well, you get calls. Can you do a pro? And you have to say no. You just can't. You don't have the time. And and when you look into these things, you you know, where are they? They're Internet radio, and that they go nowhere, basically. And it's just it's tough. It's, it's tough for everybody. Because sometimes the intentions are good, but generally these Very, are yeah, these course, are ego ego driven ventures for the for the most part. I'm afraid. Be right back. No, something is going on aboard this ship that they don't want us to see or know about. What is it? We'll have to find that out. Why wouldn't they even tell us the ship's name? <laughs> That's all part of it, Margot. While we were on deck, I looked at the lifeboats and the life preservers. The name of the ship was painted out on both of them. Oh, Mother, I almost wish we were back in the small boat. No, no, Mother, you mustn't allow yourself to... There's someone at the door. Yes. Oh, you suppose it's... Wait. The door's being unlocked. Stand behind me, Mother. May I tell you? Why, yes. Thank you. What do you want? This is ours. We shall then see so I have come to call on thee. Oh? I have no right. I'm just plain me. A grizzled old sailor who follows the sea. Well, we, uh, we appreciate your call. Yeah. Yeah. I... Yeah, well, they're polite. See where their politeness gets them in the next reel. Could you understand any of that? Uh, I heard Margo, so maybe it's... Lamont Cranston and Margot Lane in the well, shadow. They were, they were on a boat, yeah. Was well, yeah. that who it was? Yeah, they were on a ship. Okay. Yeah. And the, all the the names of the boat on all the life preservers and, and life boats were all, well, the name was painted out. Ah, uh, well, when I heard uh, Margot stand behind me, I thought that sounded like Lamont Cranston, who had the power you to cloud right. men's minds so they yeah. couldn't see him. Yep. As the shadow. All right. We have one more story here. Oh, I and think I can. You can go handle this. That. One. Yeah. This is uh, from 
a man, we will assume, they, it just says, be kind to your buds as a contributor, and we'll say he, assuming that, uh, he has just assumed a position with a major department store as the night manager. So he's fairly new to the store. We have to bear that in mind. All right. As one of my general du duties, I was required to be the last employee out of the building each night, with the exception of two security guards who were on duty all night. My usual routine would be to walk to the entire store, starting on the first floor, working to the top, checking all the merchandise. Once I cleared an area, I would shut off the lights and for the first level, children's clothing, on up to the top floor, make my way through the apartments in the dark, give the store one final check. On this particular night, I had just done my first walkthrough. I'd finished checking the third floor and headed down the elevator to the second floor. At the ele as the elevator doors opened, I thought I heard what seemed to be a child laughing and what sounded like footsteps running away from the elevator doors. I thought to myself, ah, that must be a child still in the store. So the two guards and I proceeded to turn on all of the lights and search the second level for the child that we presumed was still in the store. The two guards and I looked in every possible place that a child might hide. After an hour, we found nothing. So I instructed the two guards to go ahead, turn off all the lights, prepare to lock up the store. As the two guards secured the rest of the building, I decided to sit in the second floor, see and wait, and maybe the child would come out of hiding before I left for the night. Once again, I heard the child laugh. Not only did I hear the child laugh, but I also heard the sound of a ball being bounced on the ground. I quickly and quietly got up from the desk with flashlight in hand and headed for the most likely aisle, the toy aisle. Upon nearing the aisle, the sound of the ball and child's laugh grew louder. I was about to turn the corner to enter the toy section when a large rubber ball rolled out from the aisle as the child's laughter faded away. Startled from the ball rolling past my feet, I quickly but cautiously entered the aisle. Upon turning the corner, I used my flashlight, the whole while noticing that where the light had shown on the shelves, there were toys. All of these toys were once on the shelves, high and low, and now they were all over the floor, the top, the bottom, shelf, everywhere, on the floor. Yet there was no child to be found. I called for the guards to help once again search the second floor from the child that was apparently still in the store. Placing the merchandise back on the shelves and further searching for the child proved uneventful. We found no child. I notified the police about a child possibly still being in the store and had them check their records for any child reported missing during the day. Nothing. After doing everything I could, I decided to head home. After instructing the guards, keep their eyes and ears open for the child and notify the police when they eventually found the child. The next day, I headed to work at my normal time, eager to find out about the child's well-being, who was left in the store the night before. As I entered the building, I was greeted by my boss and asked to come into his office. As I sat down, my boss began to speak. So... I see you ran into our little ghost last night. I, now a little confused, began to tell him what had happened. My boss then proceeded to tell me about a little boy and his mother who'd come to shop at the department store back in the early 50s. As the story goes, the little boy and his mom were shopping on the second floor. As the mother was heading to the elevator with the little boy, the child let go of her hand and ran back toward the toil. When the mother noticed that her little boy had run away, she was already in the elevator and called for him to come back. The child heard his mother's call and ran back to the elevator, and then he tripped. Just as the doors started to close, unfortunately, the boy's head was crushed between the closing elevator doors, and he was killed on the spot. This was before they had safety doors on elevators. My boss further explained that ever since that incident, every few months, weird things 
would happen on the second floor, mainly in the toy aisle, just as I had described. Yeah, well, sometimes people just hang around, even if they're little people. Yeah, I had an experience, and, and I still have shivers. To me, there was nothing, few things as scary in the day, back in the day when I was almost full-time investigating haunted homes. And in one home, there was the ghost of a little girl. And to hear her laughter, to hear her singing, to hear her talking, I was convinced, I was convinced that there was really a little girl there. But the same way, whenever I would have it cornered, have the sound cornered, to shine my flashlight and nothing. But there was nothing to me as eerie as that little ghost child's laughter and uh, singing just as a little girl would. Never forgotten it, my friend. Well, well, we've heard the voices recorded. Dave and Sharon have presented them on this program. Ghost voices of people who are still here, hanging around. They don't want to go anywhere. To them, it's timeless. They're in the moment. Timeless. Well, be right back. So those were our winners. I think they were excellent stories, and yeah. there were so many. This was tough, too. Yeah. Oh, it's a tough was one. very tough, too. Well, we've very been, good stories. Yeah. We have to excellent. pause, and we'll be back. <laughs> the shadow knows. <laughs> And he always did, didn't he? Never missed him every Sunday. That was was that the big radio day? That was the big radio day. Uh yeah, yeah, because then you went from there to Jack Benny and then to Fred Allen. Edgar Bergen, excuse me, in between was Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Wow. So that that was the big day. Sunday was the big day. Well, neat. Everyone's sitting around the living room with the the big Stromberg right. Carlson radio there, <laughs> and their minds creating images. No longer necessary in this day and age. The images are all created for you, telling you what to yeah. think, telling you what to see, telling you how to react, telling you what's funny, telling you what's not funny. And there were real audiences there. So if a joke wasn't funny, they didn't laugh. No, no, it did. It bombed. <laughs> and when you when you bombed a joke on National Live Radio, the the staff I'm sure never let you forget it. And the guy that no. wrote it probably more often than not was history. But now with the laugh track, you know, it says, "Good morning, Jane," and is met by greatest laughter. You think, who are these morones, you know, who laugh at everything these people say, you know. But uh, I, I wanted to mention something about the contest, uh, the, the short story, or the article contest. Uh-huh. Uh, when Sherry finished reading them, she said, you know, I not to demean other years, but she says, I, th- I think maybe the best. the best batch we've had. And well, from I end said, to I end, I feel yeah. the same. Mm-hmm. But then we, you know, just just to give a few pointers for next year, some of them were, were overly long. You know, they had a good story, but they, they just went on and on with oh, it. Oh, they, they and, went through and the And, of limit? course, that's fine when you're writing a novel, but mm-hmm. when you're writing a brief article, you know, you have to have a pace. You have to have a rhythm to it. Uh, writing a brief article is, is very much like writing poetry. You know, it has to have that rhythm. It has to have that grace. And a few selections, if there are entries, if they would have had that, you know, they would have been the winner. So just just a little something to tuck away for the next year. Well, can they shorten them down and re-enter them next year? Oh, I don't think 
that would be a good idea. I think we should strive always for originality and something new. Well, we if it's, a, I mean, if, if thousands and thousands of stories out yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, if but it, the one people of the... who sent them can send another story. Absolutely. You sure? I mean, if these yeah. stories are that, if one of these stories is that good, but it was too long, we need to salvage it. Well, that's, we could that's call right. it. We could have a rehab category. Okay. okay. I mean, you know, I don't know. You're well, you're, the, you're the master of of the macabre, and you you know these. They were, those were good stories, though. They were very good stories. Uh, come on, the Custer what, story. They don't get any better than that, and then. The Australian two guys driving and the you no know, and the rainy bizarre. night and the ghost in the toy aisle and, the girl. and, and there are so many that were good and again as I say a wonderful batch and uh, you know just take take a little more time uh, really run it through the secret of good writing is rewriting so don't just write it and say wow I finished my story there it is. Write it again. Cut it down. Go through. Shorten the paragraphs. Jeff mentioned one of the rules that journalists have followed for centuries. That's keep the paragraph short. It's more attractive to the eye. It keeps the page. It makes the page look neat. And it's more inviting if you see that white space. It looks more like dialogue. It looks more like that that will activate your mind to Action. keep your mind yeah. fulfilled and thrilled as you're doing. Yeah, it's good. Action. Energy. Movement. Action. Uh, another thing to do is when you write a paragraph, read it out loud to yourself. Excellent. And listen to it. You'll be surprised what you'll hear. Excellent. Don't just let your eyes and your mind do it. Read it out loud. Even if you're writing a sentence, read the sentence out loud. And did that sound the best it can? And if it did, fine. But it's it's you got to have that auditory. It, it for me, it's always oh, important. That's, that's so great, Jeff. That's so great. Uh, I will write something and I'll tell Sherry read this and see what you think. And she always says, sometimes to my annoyance, she'll say, "No, you read it." I'll say, oh! <laughs> but every time you read it aloud, yeah, oh, go. Oh, go, oh, 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 did I write that? I oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. That, that's excellent result. I mean, the advice. And you get excellent results. That's what I meant to say. Okay, well, that, that should help. Were, were they over the, and I didn't count the words, were some of them over the word limit then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just kind of, Skimmed and, it. you know, we, we don't penalize if it's just a little over. When they were so long. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, anyway, superb. Uh, again, tough Excellent. tough to pick winners, but I, I do think the Custer story was took the cake. I and mean, you can just see that. And if that Civil War reenactor that wrote it was, was fooled and didn't... He was taken in, obviously, right from the beginning, that this was just a really good reenactor. Exactly, exactly. But then he got to thinking the, and, and there are some things. Now we must, you know, we, we have to allow. We don't really know if Miles Keel shot Custer in the head because you know we we found only bodies after Custer's last stand. But he he could have, he could have, from what we know of history and what we know about Grant and Keel and the mm -hmm. contempt they had for Custer. Yeah. I yeah. remember as a boy seeing they died with their boots on, and oh, Custer was my hero. Custer was this, and then I began to read books and say, "Oh man, this guy was really," and we can't say that word over the air, you know. Uh, but um, the whole thing of the we don't know who was there, and having this man provide things uh, that we do know, and this man as a reenactor, I'm right. sure knew yeah. very well. Even yeah, though yeah. he's probably a Civil War, not a frontier reenactor. It just sounds like he's a history buff. Exactly. And, of course, he was related to, you know, a, a mm -hmm. well-known historical figure. So mm -hmm. he probably had been reading history ever since he was a child. So right. that's why 
as you said, he thought it was another reenactor who really knew his stuff until yep. he said, no way. Yep. How could yep. he know all Very those things? Very good. All right. And he didn't know what a Pepsi was. We need to say good night here. Let me talk quickly. Hans has been ill today. So oh. he's been hiding under the couch in the oh. other room. And we we tested, we turned it on, held up Mario singing, and Hans still came in to hear Mario's healing voice. Think of that. He's been hiding all day. Mario brings him out. That's amazing. No, it, it isn't is amazing. amazing. It is we and it is We just tested to see, will he yeah. come tonight too, like he does every night? And he did. Well, I hope he feels better. Well, thank you. Little guy. All right, you two. Thank you. See you next month. And Indeed. Happy Halloween to you and everyone. And in, it was a wonderful art and ghost story year for the program and for all of you. Enjoy it. They're all posted for you. Take care. Give the lady a hug and give little Hans a hug, too. Okay. Good night. Happy, happy Halloween. Blessings yes. to everyone. Indeed. And good night to all of you. Thanks for being here. Have fun. Uh, enjoy the archives. Uh, remember, each day is a present. Make the most of it. Act soon. <laughs>